Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Hausen. In this law session, we will consider the sources of the Constitution, certainly the sources of the British Constitution. And what we will consider, of course, is since there is an uncodified Constitution in the UK, what does that mean in respect of where to look for constitutional matters or constitutional uh, issues? The point, of course, is that I have somewhat left this particular law session for later on when you've actually already listened to the separation of powers law session or indeed the law session in relation to parliamentary sovereignty or that of the rule of law. Because I feel that the sources of the Constitution are certain types of areas where knowledge in particular areas are necessary. So I would of course urge you to at the very least consider looking at the Royal Prerogative Law Session before you do this or indeed the Law Session on uh, Separation of Powers. That said, let's consider what are the sources. Well, you already know of course that the British Constitution or the UK United Kingdom's Constitution more or less rests on an uncodified framework. So where are the sources to determine to determine what are the rules in relation to what we know the broad meaning of a constitution is? Well, the sources can be divided into three categories, and these are the legal rules of the constitution, number one, the non-legal rules of the constitution, number two, and other sources of the constitution, number three. Now, if we consider legal rules, within legal rules, you have two main sources. These are legislation and, of course, the case law. Now, as it relates to legislation, these are, ver th these are a very important and very extensive source. Because at any given time, you have an extraordinary amount of legislation coming out of Parliament, and these, of course, provide the basis for uh, certainly uh, constitutional matters such as when you look at what is uh, a constitution supposed to deal with it of course includes things like who will be part of the legislature how is the legislature uh, uh, elected how and who may uh, be someone eligible to stand as an MP these are questions of course that certainly need to be answered in the framework of a constitution and there's legislation which certainly does that. Now, when you look at uh, the types of examples in relation to uh, uh, legislation, well, there are certain historic documents such as the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights, not technically legislation, but nonetheless significant uh, documents of uh, legislative influence and these are important for establishing, for example, um, the constitutional principles uh, which stand, such as the idea that the king or the monarch or the executive does not have unlimited power, but these documents do not have to be the special formal legal status of a written constitution. Indeed, when you look at all laws, in the UK, they are ordinary laws. And here I'm talking about statutes. So whether it concerns constitutional matters or any other matters, does not place them above any other types of legislation. The point here, of course, is when you look at what, give rise, what gives rise to the sources which go to laying out the framework for the UK's constitution, you can find them in statutes. But that said, these statutes they have constitutional significance, but that does not mean they are of such constitutional precedence, meaning that they are inviolate. That's not the point. It certainly is that they provide the basis. So you may look in the United States Constitution and it tells you who can be a member of, for example, the Congress and so on. In the UK, who can be a member of Parliament? You're going to have to look at a statute. Now, a lot of the UK Constitution uh, is not law at all, but rather 
another quirky area called constitutional conventions, which were, of course, defined by A.V. Dicey in his uh, Law of the Constitution as understandings, habits, practices, which although they may regulate the conduct of the members of the sovereign uh, and, and these powers are not in reality laws or when you look at the, the powers as they are exercised under the convention, they are not laws as they are not enforced by the courts. Much of the more important parts of the constitution of the United Kingdom can be found in conventional rules. So for example, when you look at the office of the prime minister, it is by convention, of course, that we see who that is. When you look at the cabinet, when you look at ministerial responsibility, how uh, considerable legal powers of the queen, uh, prerogative powers, are exercised by ministers in the queen's name or in the monarchy's name, we see that even though you talk about royal prerogative, by convention, it is exercised by the prime minister and his cabinet. So the point is, when you look at the sources, start off with legislation, we see that you have uh, the case law, we see that uh, there is conventions. Now, carrying on in respect of conventions, as they are not law, they are not legally enforceable, as I said. Classic case for this, of course, is Attorney General and Jonathan Cape in 1976. And whilst in one sense, conventions are constant, there is a contrary argument that they may also be said to be constantly changing. So from the standpoint of legislation being a, a source, we see that though not technically uh, legislation, you look at Bill of Rights, you look at uh, Magna Carta. We also, of course, come to the Act of Settlement 1700, the Act of Union with Scotland 1707, the European Communities Act 1972, the Human Rights Act 1998, what makes these significant? What makes them important? Well, the point, of course, is that when you look at these types of legislation, they have significant impact as a source of the Constitution. Because when you look, for example, at the Human Rights Act, it does, of course, set out what are the rights in relation to the citizen in certain areas, which is one of the things that a Constitution will undoubtedly need to provide for. When you look at the ECA and certainly the laws that govern the uh, jurisdiction, the European Communities Act of 1972 does allow for the UK to have arguably given up some of its uh, sovereignty in signing up to the European Union because by virtue of Section 2.1, we see that there is some degree of primacy of EU law where there is inconsistent national law. So that as a source of uh, the, cons that amounts to a source of the constitution because what we have here are acts which go to saying how, for example, the uh, jurisdiction is run. Now acts dealing with the electoral system and parliament. So for example, representation of the People's Act the Parliamentary Constituencies Act of 1986, the House of Commons Disqualification Act, Life Peerages Act, the Peerages Act of 1963, Parliament Acts of 1911 and, and 1949, and of course, the House of Lords Act 1999. What are the significance of these? It is talking about the people who are within the framework of the three organs of the state. It deals with who can sit in the House of Lords, who can sit in the House of Commons. When you look at the idea of peers, the Parliament Act talks about how, for example, uh, um, when you look at how a bill being passed. So these are constitutional matters. And then you, of course, have these Acts of Parliaments which enshrine these constitutional matters. Now, of course, you have Acts relating to the monarchy. And those, of course, deal with how issues relating to the monarchy are dealt with. So, for example, the Declaration of Abdication Act 1936, the Regency Acts 1937 and 1953, and as it relates to Commonwealth relations, 
the Statute of Westminster, 1931. And we do see the Statute of Westminster coming up in various cases, particularly if you go back to the law session on the rule of law, we do see, for example, uh, various situations where this becomes relevant. But for our purposes, what we can see is that there are several pieces of legislation which certainly provide for constitutional matters which, in a jurisdiction with a codified constitution, these would have been provided for. Now, of course, I would urge you to bear in mind that the European uh, community or EU law as it were, has become a huge source as it relates to law within the UK and therefore the constitution of the UK. But bear in mind that the EU impact is only in the areas of its competence, meaning the competence of the EU. So it only talks about the four fundamental freedoms. Do bear in mind that the UK did not, for example, sign up to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So as it relates to rights of the citizens, you still have to go back to the HR, HRA. So what you have are the types of legislations coming out of the EU. So for example, the treaty itself and treaty articles which are relevant, as well as regulations and directives which are the types of legislation emanating from the EU. All of these have an impact in respect of uh, the constitution of the UK. Now, case law as a source is relevant because what we have are judicial decisions which are of such significance that the cases are taken as being the basis for particular constitutional law principles. Now, when you look at judicial decisions, there are two principal forms. There's the common law proper. So you have laws and customs of the realm declared to be law from early times by the decision of judges in particular cases, including, of course, prerogative powers. And these, for example, look at cases like Entick and Carrington, which as well has been uh, raised in previous lectures, Liversidge and Anderson, and Council of the Civil Service Union and Minister for the Civil Service, the GCHQ case, which has also been raised in our previous lectures. So that's the first part, is looking at the common law proper when you look at case law. But the second way, in respect of a source, is looking at the interpretation of statute law. So you have the cases which provide from the common law's perspective and the judicial decision which stands for that particular uh, 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 concept. So when you go to the GCHQ case and when you look, for example, at looking at the difference between high policy and whether or not it is, has to do with individual civil liberties. But the second important aspect is looking at how the courts have interpreted statute because the courts have the task of interpreting statute where the correct meaning of an act is disputed. Now, since most government powers come from statutes, the judicial decisions on their interpretation are very significant indeed. We're going to take a short break now, and as soon as we come back, we will certainly carry on with looking at how uh, the sources of law uh, uh, impact in the UK uh, jurisdiction because what you need to see is where the constitution pulls from in order to make sure that there is some kind of uh, formal framework in inverted commas because there is no formal framework by way of a single codified document so looking at the courses we've identified some to date after the break we will carry on with looking at the case law and continue with the law session. <laughs>